you. We, tonight we are so thrilled to have former Speaker of the House of Florida. What is it? Come on up here. Um, now running, deciding to uh, take on Senator Bill Nelson in a huge way. Let's welcome Adam Hansen. <laughs> So we're so thrilled to have you here tonight. Thank you so much for what you're doing. And he, um, we're going to have be able to share with us and then some questions afterwards. I have been, I have been so humbled by the support and the encouragement that I have been receiving as I have traveled the state. And as you can see tonight, I'm here again by myself, driving myself around. I do have one companion. I think some of you may know my companion's name. It's Garmin. My GPS. <laughs> but seeing as I'm from Palm Beach County and I represented Palm Beach and Broward County in the state legislature for eight years and served as the majority leader of the Florida House of Representatives, was actually tapped by Marco Rubio when he was the Speaker of the Florida House. Marco Rubio tapped me to serve as the majority leader of the Florida House and I served for two years under Speaker Rubio, and then I had the privilege and honor to do what is not very common in the state legislature, which was to serve an additional term as the majority leader. And that's because everyone recognized that I was fighting for conservative Republican principles, even when it wasn't popular back during the beginning days of the Charlie Crist administration. And everybody remembers that when Charlie Crist was governor, he was trying to drive the Republican Party to the middle. It was his agenda saying, we don't, need, we don't need to be conservative. The best way to beat the Democrats is to join them. And I said no. I said no. I said no. Republicans don't need to be less partisan. We need to be more principled. And that's what we're doing again today. And that's why this is so exciting, because several years ago, groups like this in this room and in rooms like it all around the state and all around the country said, enough is enough. We want our leaders, we want our leaders to tell it like it is. And if you're not going to get the job done, we are going to find somebody else who will. And that is what, and that is what 2010's election was. 2010's election was the first wave of sending those conservative principled leaders to Washington and to the state capitals here in Florida and around the country. But it's still not enough because not everyone has received the message. 2012, we need to send in reinforcements so that we can get the job done in Washington. I think many of you are watching the same news reports that I'm watching and we're starting to see some of the debate. And I'm proud to say that I think Republicans in Washington finally got the message. No more continuing resolutions. No more short-term spending measures. We cannot be afraid of the political consequences of the possibility of a government shutdown. What we need to remind people, what are the consequences to our country if we fail to act? Because right now, the politicians in Washington are spending money that America just doesn't have. And they are bankrupting our nation, both fiscally and morally. And we have to make sure that we stay vigilant in sending the constant message to Washington. Cut the spending, stop the borrowing, balance the budget, and attack the debt. And that means when the time comes in a few weeks from now, I say that we send the message to Washington, no, on raising the debt ceiling. Because I'm sure everyone or, or most of us are carrying around a little piece of plastic in our wallets or in our purses. It's a credit card. And it's very similar, it's very analogous to what is taking place in Washington, the debate because America has reached its credit limit. 
And what some politicians in Washington are saying essentially is, let's just call up our creditors and say, can you just raise our credit limit one more time? Yeah, yeah. We, know, we know that we haven't been good. We know we haven't made good on the promise of paying it back. But just this one more time, raise our credit limit. We know that just like families, just like businesses, government has to live within its means. That's why it's so important that we begin the process of cutting spending. It's why we need to, to follow along with what Congressman Paul Ryan has done. I applaud him for the bold leadership. His leadership at the very beginning, you know, there were other Republicans out there who were saying, there were other Republicans out there who were saying, we need presidential leadership in order to address these issues. If we wait for presidential leadership, we've already seen what President Obama's budget projects for the next 10 years, doubling the national debt on top of what it already is. Paul Ryan understands that Republicans need to be bold. We also know that we're going to be attacked. We're going to be called names. They're going to say, just like Chuck Schumer said, that this is an extreme proposal. What's extreme, what's immoral, is actually doing nothing, is actually allowing the status quo to continue. Because if we do that, if we do that, America is going to drive right off of the cliff. We are going to be headed for economic doom. It takes courage to propose what Paul Ryan did as it relates to Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security and entitlement spending. And all of the areas of the federal budget need to be on the table. I applaud the leadership of, of our hometown congressman, Alan West, oh, for proposing yeah. defense spending cuts yeah. as well. Yeah. That's somebody who understands what we can do to shore up other areas of the budget. This isn't going to be easy. We know that the Democrats are going to attack us. We know that they are going to call us names. But we know that the moral thing to do for our country's future, for our children and for our grandchildren, is to preserve the solvency of these entitlement programs so that we can be able to pass on that American promise to our children and to our grandchildren. And I've spent a few minutes talking about the national debt and the fiscal mess that we're in today and, and certainly the direction that we are heading in if we don't address these challenges head on. But I also want to share with you that our $14 trillion national debt is now also our nation's greatest national security threat. We cannot continue to keep borrowing from countries that do not share our values and interests. There are some countries like China and others that we're borrowing from. And every single time that America can't act on the global stage in our best interests and take that moral authority and that moral leadership, I would submit to you that each and every time that happens, little by little, we are effectively losing our nation's very own sovereignty. Now the problem that we have is that we currently have an administration that believes that it is better for America to fit in with the rest of the world rather than lead it. And we saw during the recent events, whether it was in Egypt or just recently and ongoing in Libya, we saw the president's lack of clarity, lack of leadership, lack of objectives, lack of consulting with Congress. We talk about, talk about hypocrisy, this is the same president who while he was campaigning for office criticized George W. Bush for going into Afghanistan and Iraq with much more support, not just the support of Congress, but the support of the American people. And yet this president goes in, I think they're calling it a kinetic military action. Some people would actually call it war. But this president doesn't know how to lead this country in these difficult times where you get up and you speak clearly with a voice and America goes forward and others join us because we have that moral authority and that moral leadership. Now, a lot of people during this time have tried to determine whether Obama's actions in Libya result in some type of foreign policy doctrine that the Obama administration will use in, in future instances. 
And I'm not sure if there's a doctrine that comes out of Libya, but I can tell you that the Obama foreign policy doctrine started on the first day that he took office. Exactly. And the Obama foreign policy doctrine of engaging America's enemies and distancing America from our allies is making us less safe, less trusted, and less respected around the world. I saw today, I saw today, and I had the brief opportunity to mention it with some folks enjoying their dinner. You saw another attack on innocent Israeli civilians from Gaza today. America must continue to stand with our only ally in the Middle East, and that is the State of Israel. I mentioned earlier about President Obama's lack of clarity and lack of moral leadership and lack of putting America first on the global stage. Compare that and contrast that to President Ronald Reagan, who embodied the spirit that America is safer when America is stronger and that the world is a better place when America takes that moral leadership. But unfortunately, you cannot fight an enemy when you are not even willing to admit that an enemy even exists. And that enemy has a name, and that enemy has a mission, and that is Sharia-compliant Islam. And we cannot, we cannot allow political correctness, multiculturalism, or appeasement cripple our defenses at home or abroad. Because this is a threat that exists not only on foreign soil and from foreign lands, but this is now a threat from those who seek to destroy us from within. And let me just share with you that Sharia law is not compatible with the Constitution of the United States of America. I get, to talk, I get to talk often to, to groups and in some Republican circles people share with you that now's not the time to talk about social issues, about the so-called social issues. But let me submit to you that America's economic prosperity, America's strong national security, and our foundational Judeo-Christian principles are interwoven and inseparable. It is actually the breakdown of the family and the breakdown and the deterioration of our values as a country that has led to the dependency society to grow. And as we have grown the size of government, we've effectively lost in many ways so much of our own freedoms. And we must recapture that belief that America's exceptionalism is based on the spirit of the individual, not the power of the state. And so, as I've been traveling the state, and I was in Orlando and Seminole County yesterday, I'm back home here in Palm Beach and, and Broward, and I have to tell you, the folks from around the state, I've just been so pleased by, by the encouragement and support and the welcome I've been getting, but they are just so surprised that there is a conservative from Palm Beach and Broward County. <laughs> Tell them, I tell them that they need to come down here and see all the friends who are, as I like to say, who are fighting behind enemy lines. But each and every one of each and every one of you knows what is at stake. Each and every one of you knows how important the next election is. And I mentioned earlier that we cannot get America headed back into the right direction until we take back control of the United States Senate and make Barack Obama a one-term president. Yes. Bill, Nelson, Bill Nelson's won a few elections in his time. A lot of people like him. But what I would tell you is this, is that Bill Nelson is not going to be able to cover up his voting record supporting stimulus and supporting bailouts and Obamacare and car checking, cap and trade. He's not going to be able to cover up his rubber stamp voting record for the Obama agenda with a southern accent and a charming smile. Because the people in this room and in rooms around the state 
are more educated and more energized than ever before. Yes. And I think you know, I think you also know that you're not going to be fooled by other politicians who are trying to reinvent themselves as conservatives in 2012 just because it's popular. The best news that I have is that I don't need to reinvent myself for 2012. I was a conservative even before it was popular. I was on the front lines fighting those battles with you. And now I am so proud to have the opportunity to travel the state to deliver this message. And I tell people and I remind them, my message is the same whether I'm in Palm Beach or Panama City. This election is critical. We have done the job of sending the first wave to Washington. We still have so much more work to do. We must recapture the United States Senate, but it's not just enough to send Republicans to Washington. We need to send principled leaders who have the courage to say what needs to be said, and more importantly, the proven record to do what needs to be done, even in the face of adversity, to take on those in their own party, even when it's not popular. That's why... That's why I'm so, I'm so privileged to be with you here tonight. More importantly, though, I'm so thankful for what you are doing. And together, we are going to work over the coming days and weeks and months ahead to recapture and restore the American promise for today and for future generations. Thank you all so much. Wow. For